Okay, so it is 2 p.m. plus two minutes, so I think we really can, can start with the session. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am uh, Elena Perotti from the World Association of News Media, One IFRA, and uh, I'm, I was focal point in the organization of this, uh, of this session. As you all know by now, because we're at the last day of Eurodig, Eurodig is all about participation of the audience, so we'll, we will try as much as possible to make that happen in this, uh, in this workshop as well. Um, first of all, I would like to, of course, welcome you all and uh, uh, welcome our uh, remote moderator, Antonio, who is sitting behind there, and he will be uh, moderating the questions that come from the online audience. Uh, welcome to Marco who's sitting here. Uh, Marco is, uh, uh, is the reporter of this uh, workshop. He will be drafting messages that we will read at the end of this session and hopefully agree on. It, uh, agree upon. It is an important part of this process because the messages from all the, all the workshops and all the sessions will uh, end up in the messages from The Hague. Uh, the, our official, uh, they will be our official contributions both to those, uh, to those messages, to the document, and also to the plenary number seven that is happening right after this session um, and is called Online Harms at 4.30. So, Welcome to all our key participants. As you know, Yurdig doesn't have speakers, but rather participants who are key to the, to the discussion. Uh, first of all, we have Marcy, who is our moderator. She will introduce herself later, <laughs> better. We have uh, Mariah here, Mariah from uh, DROG. She will uh, help us play um, the game uh, Bad News, the Bad News game. Then we have Derek, uh, who is head of social news gathering at the European Broadcasting Union. And uh, we have Adeline, who is a Belgian manager for Lie Detector. But you will be learning more about them later on. Um, before leaving the, uh, the floor to Marcy, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, myself and why I'm here. <laughs> I, uh, I work in, in, the media, uh, in the media policy and public affairs department of, the, of ONEFRA, which is the World Association of News Media, and is based in Paris. We have had a newspaper in education operation for a very long time, and we uh, have just rebooted this uh, initiative towards uh, a more news literacy oriented network. Uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, very prominent members of this network right here. We have Chris van Hall from the, from the uh, Netherlands Association, and we have Asla Gottlieb, who has been advising on uh, uh, literacy publishers in, uh, in Denmark for decades now. <laughs> um, our objective is just to, is, is to bring uh, the conversation, um, to enlarge the conversation, not only to experts, but also to uh, students, teachers, and uh, ideally families as well, um, around, the, around how literacy and news literacy in particular, much more than media literacy, can help uh, fight the, the disinformation fight. Um, the most important thing about, the, about fake news, um, I think, is to call it the right way, and fake news is not the right name. Fake news is, um, is uh, an expression that was weaponized, that has been presented and used, and it is being used right now, uh, just to identify content that, uh, that people don't like, that people don't agree with, so we're going to call it disinformation from now on, and I really think it is important that, uh, that we all know this. And secondly, there is no best way to, to fight uh, a war, because that is what it is, than going behind enemy lines. And this is what Mariah will, will let us do, to see how, bad, uh, how fake news are created and how propaganda is um, invented and used in order to, ma uh, to manipulate the population towards thinking what the villain wants us to think. So we'll now leave the um, uh, floor to Marcy who will navigate us through this session, and, uh, and we will talk later. Bye. Well, you have it. Okay. Oh, I think this works. Hello? Oh, yeah, it works. Uh, I'm Maartje Spoelstra. I um, am coordinator of the Safer Internet Center in the Netherlands, which is part of a European program, uh, Better Internet for Kids. 
Uh, and also from this respect, I am very much interested in uh, preparing children on be, yeah, becoming a critical uh, reader of the news. Uh, so I've also worked in the library and I've given several workshops at schools um, to prepare both uh, children and their parents uh, by becoming the film themselves to be more uh, critical and more aware of how news, even if it's true, how it can frame you by uh, antagonizing or using other techniques. Uh, so I'm also very enthusiastic about the game that was invented by Droog, which is also the organization that Marije works for. So it's an organization that invented the game to be the villain yourself. So I can understand you are all quite curious to this game because to be honest, everybody likes to play the villain sometimes. I will now give the microphone to Marije van Droog. Ah. <coughs> Thanks, Marci, for the introduction. Um, let me start with a warning. Uh, I'm going to warn you a bit because what I'm going to tell you is going to sound very counterintuitive. Because uh, I teach people how to make their own fake news. We own a few fake news websites at Droog. Uh, we manage the first Dutch troll army. And uh, we organized an event not so long ago where we tried to destroy the European Union Parliament elections with a disinformation campaign. Uh, and if you think I'm a horrible person now, bear with me because I hope I will be able to leave you with some good food for thought for after this session. Um, as I said, we teach people how to make their own fake news and we do this because we believe that the very best way to teach people how disinformation works is by doing it yourself. That's the best way to learn, to learn to think like the bad guy. Um, and um, this is, in one sentence, the entire idea that, that our company is based on. We put people in the shoes of the fake news monger uh, in order to try to build mental antibodies against fake news or against disinformation in their heads. Um, this idea is based on a theory of on a theory from social psychology called the inoculation theory. And this is a theory that says you can vaccinate people against misleading information by exposing them to a weakened version so they learn to recognize it and build resistance. Um, and to this end, we also developed the bad news game, um, which works um, as follows. You, you have to spread your own fake news. We are going to play the game in a few minutes. You, ha you have to spread your own disinformation you have to gain as many followers as possible, and at the same time, you have to maintain your credibility as a new source. And over the course of the game, you play through a few badges, and these badges correspond with techniques that are usually used in disinformation campaigns. So in this way, you learn to think through the mechanisms that are sometimes used against you at the same time. Um, we're not just doing this on our own. We're doing research together with the University of Cambridge into these so-called mental antibodies against fake news. Um, and our first research shows, so what, what we did is we include a pre-post survey with the game. Uh, th the players have to read uh, six news messages, two r real ones and four fake ones, and they have to judge them on a scale of one to 10 on whether they think they're reliable or not. And what you can see is that there is no decrease or only a very slight decrease in, the, in how much they trust the real news uh, and a sharp decrease in how much they trust the fake news. So they do get more resistant to disinformation after playing our game. And this effect remains low after one week of playing and after five weeks of playing. Uh, so this is a very promising first step in our international vaccination program against disinformation. Um, this is the article that we published. Uh, this was published last year, and it became uh, quickly the most cited article in the history of the journal. Um, and the next uh, st st study on the effects of the game will be published in two weeks in Nature Communications. This is my colleague who works at the University of Cambridge, Jon Rosenbeek, and he was live last week, last year, sorry, on CNN to talk about the workings of the game. Who of you thinks this is real? Do you think we were on CNN or not? Can I see hands who thinks it's real? <laughs> no one, one person. It is actually real. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can look it up uh, on YouTube if you want. 
Um, if you're interested, we have published the game in uh, now 30 languages in total. Also, there are junior versions, which you can access by writing slash junior after the uh, URL. And now I guess let's start playing the game. Um, so as I said, we are, I'm going to ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the bad guy. So you, have go you are going to have to shut down your moral compass for the next 20 minutes. You're going to have to be as bad as possible. You're probably going to feel a bit uncomfortable at some point. That's a good thing. That means it's working. <laughs> so let's play. Okay. Hey. Um, we are here for the position of disinformation tycoon. We have just been recruited as a, as a fake news monger, so to say. Um, we are angry about something, right? Um, are we still a bit doubting or are we like, yeah, let's go do this. Let's disrupt a bit. Okay, let's go. Yeah, post a frustrated tweet. Okay, this government is a complete and utter failure. Are we angry enough about the government or do we want another? Can I show hands who is for, we're angry about the government, let's post this. Yeah, more, what are the other options? I'm not, yeah, okay, let's click not angry enough. The mainstream media is one massive conspiracy, hashtag fake news. That's a good one, okay, let's go for that one. Tweet this. Okay, so we gained 25 followers, which is a good, like, it's a good start. Um, it starts to start. <laughs> okay, we need some, to build up a, a bit of uh, credibility, of course, because we, we want to be a serious news source. Let's, we're ready for this, yeah. Okay, we're going to skip this survey because that's going to take us another extra 20 minutes, which we don't have time for in this session, so no thank you. Got it. Okay. Are we going to fake an official Twitter account or are we going to impersonate someone important? Who is for faking a Twitter account? And impersonating someone important? Good, that's the majority. <laughs> okay, after long deliberation with my generals, I have decided to declare war on North Korea, Kim Jong Dong. Uh, let's go for the other options. Or NASA, Meteorite alert, large space objects set to hit US West Coast, hashtag be safe. Or the last one. We are announcing immediate and permanent cancellation of SpongeBob SquarePants, hashtag I'm ready. Are we going for Trump? Who's, who, who wants to uh, impersonate Trump? Who is going for NASA? Okay, and who's going for Nickelodeon? I think NASA is the winner. Sorry? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's go for that one, yeah. Okay. Did we, did we notice NASA's slightly different username? Can you, you can scroll up to, to check it a bit. Okay. Let's check the reactions. Jane, medical doctor, says, ah, help, watch out, everyone be safe, hashtag pray for USA. Check another. Okay, this looks serious, says Ben the engineer. I hope this isn't the apocalypse. <laughs> okay, moving on. How are we feeling? Are we feeling good or are we having, are we having moral objections? Who says I'm feeling good about this? Yeah, okay, good. Good, very good. <laughs> okay. So, we can go on like this, of course. Do we wanna go pro? Yeah? Good. <laughs> Let's, shall we start a news site or shall we start a blog? Which one do you think is more credible? News site? Right, very good, yeah. Good choice. Let's pick a name. We can go for the Cosmos Post or the Honest Truth Online or the Best Words. Who goes for the Best Words? or the Dutch Post, or what was the other one? Honest Truth Online? That's okay. Honest Truth Online, perfect. Okay, 
Are we going to be the, the editor-in-chief or an anonymous goon? Okay. Editor-in-chief, right, very good. Good, a slogan then. Now online, honest truth online, bursting the mainstream media bubble. Or, now online, a concerned citizen's personal opinion. Nah, not that one. Or, what they don't want you to read. <laughs> That's a good one, right? Let's go for that one. <laughs> good. Honest Truth Online has become the basis of our fake news empire. Okay, so we just won the first badge. We're now excellent impersonators of someone important and I think I should give the floor now to either, yeah. Thanks. Um, so now we talk about impersonation. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Adeline real quick just for you to remember. Adeline is a program director for lie detectors and she organizes workshops for children and youngsters to meet journalists to talk about uh, among one of them topics is fake news. So could you maybe give your view on impersonation from your daily uh, life? <laughs> well, I would rather say from our activities at lie detectors because in my daily life, personal life, I'm not impersonating oh. anybody. <laughs> but um, uh, yes, so uh, lie detectors is a, um, a news literacy program that works with uh, uh, younger people to introduce you a bit uh, uh, what we're doing and, and what I'm going to say later on. Uh, so we're working, uh, we aim at starting a conversation uh, with kids aged 10 to 15 about uh, online disinformation, but also uh, the, 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 the practical functioning of uh, uh, a journalism, ethical journalism. Uh, we do so by visiting classrooms uh, in, in Europe with journalists that we train and, and select, that we select and then that we train to uh, deliver a very interactive and an entertaining session to the, uh, to the students. And what happens basically is we do the same as we just did right now. So we make, we propose them uh, to them uh, various uh, news items and then we ask for a show of hands to see who believes it or not. And um, basically uh, what happens here with uh, engineers and medical doctors in the game that are believing the, the items is actually also replicated with uh, uh, younger kids. And um, we try to do so to make sure that they get um, uh, a view of the social functioning of fake news as well. That's to say that usually when they are presented with uh, uh, some items saying that uh, Donald Trump and um, uh, Macron have uh, had a dinner at the Eiffel Tower for a million euros, then they, and then we ask them, is this right or is this wrong? And they're like, checking their neighbor to see is this right. Yeah, if he says yes, then I say yes. And then they experience what it is. So this is basically uh, also the same system as the, as the bad news game. We really try to work with uh, experiential learning. And um, what we noticed is that impersonation, well, this works uh, uh, very well on kids and, and for certain reasons as well, is that because they don't um, they don't have the same experience as uh, adults when they consume news. So they would rely on other cues if they're being presented with uh, um, an article or a website. That one of our concrete examples is a um, satirical website called um, Science Info. I can tell you this is very, very uh, tricky for young people and there is science, miss, so that's right. And the reason behind this, I think it's because they don't have the same cues as we do. So uh, for, a young, uh, for a young audience to uh, uh, be um, um, resilient against this type of, of fake items, um, we really have to go back to the simple process of uh, what is it? How do you name that? Is it a lie? Is it propaganda? We're not going to call them impersonation. We're not going to call that impersonation with kids. We're going to call, they're going to say, oh, miss, this is a lie. This is 
um, this is uh, uh, bullying someone by taking their identity. So they have their own uh, uh, views on that. And, and we really try to, to, to get that from the kids and then to explain, okay, why is it there? Why do you impersonate someone? Why do you believe that? And with this whole inoculation theory, we can also see that they, they, they understand in their own term what is confirmation bias. Why do you m want to believe that about that personality or, or this scientist? Uh, we have also very, um, uh, something that works really well is articles about um, uh, fruits curing cancer uh, and this is uh, 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 a theory by Dr. XYZ. If there is doctor, there is no, absolutely no um, uh, questioning from the kids. And this is what we try to, to, to work on. And um, yes, we really try to go through the process and, and, and of why, with what consequences and, 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 and this whole questioning. And we do that with young audiences because we believe that um, there is, um, it's an age where uh, there is no filter of experience yet. So at 10 year old, those, uh, those kids are still, um, uh, uh, they don't have uh, their um, environment that, have, that has, uh, uh, that has um, effect, uh, affected them yet. They are still able to uh, get this questioning um, uh, a bit better. Uh, no, we work with journalists as well because we really want to make sure that they meet uh, a journalist to make sure that they understand the difference between uh, a flawed uh, reporting and uh, uh, real, um, um, really disinformation. And this can only be done if uh, the journalist is there in the classroom. So in this, in this case for this- You have a one minute warning oh, now. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. But I have so much to say, but I, 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 will leave it, I'll leave, I'll leave it at that and I'll, I'll leave for the rest then. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, now we also, we have talked about impersonation. What is also a very famous technique and for which not only children, also adults, also people, people that had a higher education are vulnerable is emotion. Every message that uh, appeals very strongly to your emotion, example, a puppy that, was, that died because the vegetarian owners didn't want to give it meat, emotion makes it easier for you to want to read a message and also makes it easier to um, reach a lot of audience, create uh, motion. Uh, to, this, to illustrate this, uh, Maraya will uh, play with you the next batch. Yes. So, we left the game when just we learned how to impersonate uh, an authority or something. Yeah, yeah, next. Um, but we need content of our blog, of course. True. And we want to go for emotional content because that is a much easier way to mobilize people and have them act in a certain way you want or drive them away from the center. and. Um, uh, let's browse some exploitable headlines. Climate change should have a serious negative impact on a way of life. Um, or genetically modified foods pose no risk at all to health, experts say in a new report. Do we want to go for health risks or for climate change? Who goes for health risks? One, two, three, of climate change? Yeah, that's more people. Yeah, let's go for climate change. No, the climate change. Oh, you went, no, okay. Let's go for the GMOs instead, okay. What is our, what is our opinion on GMOs? Will they bring about the apocalypse or do we not really care? They bring about the apocalypse, right? That's what, yeah, bring about the apocalypse. Okay, it's going way too far. What's next, Gen genetically modified pets? That's crazy, indeed. Okay, we're going to exploit people's basic emotions. Are we going to personally attack scientists? Are we going to get emotional? Or are we going to talk about science? Who is for attacking scientists? 
one, two, three people get emotional. That's more people. And the GMO science? Okay, let's go for the get emotional. Good, okay. Are we going to make a meme or publish an article? Who's for meme? Mean, okay, very good. Let's make one. Check out the options. Uh, no, they should be loading an image now, there it is. Okay, this man is devastated, he, has lost, he lost his whole family to GMO food. Okay, let's check out the other ones. Yeah, click, don't like it. GMO meat harmless, my dog is fighting for his life. Or, yes, nah. GMO food makes me so sad. <laughs> Okay, back to the first one. Who's for the first one? Uh, that's already a majority, I guess. Let, let's go for that one. Post on Honest Truth Online. Not bad. Personal confessions evoke empathy, right? Uh, and we got a couple of followers. Let's check how they were reacting to us. Kurt, the angry citizen, says, story like, like this keep popping up on the government is doing nothing, hashtag GMO hoax. Uh, Kim, my kids are all right, saying, sorry about your family, what a horrifying story. That looks good too. And we're getting new followers. They are ready to blow. And all we did was just play into the basic emotions with one simple image with, with, with some words, actually. Okay, let's keep going. Do we want to go for exploiting anger or fear? Who's for anger? Who's for fear? That's the majority, vast majority. Good. Danger, vitamin C pills contain nuclear waste. Let's post that. <laughs> ah, we got no more followers. So the content doesn't matter, right? It's about the language, the image that invokes an emotion. So what you're actually writing doesn't matter if you want to mobilize people to, to come follow you. Okay, true. That was emotion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, for emotion, we're going to Derek. I will bring you the microphone. Uh, just a heads up. Derek is the head of social news gathering. So if we're talking about emotion, what is your view on that? Uh, well, as you've seen, uh, you know, um, content drives emotion through, through people, whether it's fear, anger, uh, disgust. People will always have a connection to um, a story, a person, or a content. It could be your husband, it could be your wife. You have some emotional connection to something they do, something they say. Um, but I'm gonna start by showing you a real example of emotion. First of all, I need you all to close your eyes because I'm gonna do a magic trick. Um, can I have the clicker? So I want you to imagine that you are 11 years of age and you are trapped in a cave in Thailand where only one person at a time can fit through a very, very narrow gap. And there is no hope. You're told you may be there for weeks. All you can hear is the water dripping in the back. Now, if you're in that cave, there's a sense of horror and tragedy and overall fear coming from yourself. But when you read that and you hear about it on the news and you envision it, that's when news and emotion become intrinsically linked. So you can open your eyes again. So did this look like the image that you had in your head at the time inside the cave? Quiet, dark, very, very tight, you can't get through, and basically people fearing for their life. So when the news broke of the, the team, the Thai uh, football team, that these young boys had been trapped in a cave in Thailand, this video started to circulate online. And as you can see, um, it is exactly what we were told it was by the mainstream media, by the news organizations themselves, very tight space that people could not get through, the boys were going to be trapped for quite a long time. 
but you can also see the context that's put behind this. Um, people adding different pieces of stories to it. And you can also see the amount of retweets and likes that it gets. And of course, people want to be part of a conversation. They want to be involved. They want to share their sentiments on a particular topic and story with the general public. And as you can see, the video is shared online on Facebook with two million people viewing the video, the exact same video. As you can see, more people sharing the links to the video, more context, more emotive thoughts and sentiments issued about it. And of course, you can see here more people adding what is the context behind the story mixed with their own views and their own personal values about a particular topic. But the problem is, is when new mainstream news organizations start picking up the same video and running it, and as you can see here, Seven News Brisbane ran this particular video um, around generating some interest in the story. And of course, this all brings emotion and how people are invested in a particular story. But the problem is, is that you need to verify content when you do this. And my team at the European Broadcasting Union, which is involved in verification of content and ensuring content is fit for purpose, uh, did a reverse image search through Google taking a picture from the video, which is the most dramatic uh, thumbnail, I suppose, of the, of the video itself. And as you can see here, this video is from the United States of America in 2012. And the person who uploaded the video was actually kind enough to give us the actual location of where the video was shot. But the point I'm trying to make here about emotion is that, yes, we all want to be part of a conversation. Some of those actors are for good. They want to try to influence a story with correct, positive information. And yes, of course, there is bad actors out there who want to disseminate misinformation uh, or disseminate uh, untruths to benefit a certain, um, I suppose, agenda or perspective. But the main thing is, is that we all, are, uh, we don't all have an emotional reaction to something, whether it's your football team, a story in the news, um, it could be your pet, it could be a family moment, a special cherished moment in your life. We all have an emotional response uh, to content, but online the control of that information is proving quite difficult in terms of everybody having a free reign to have their own emotions over a particular piece of content. So now we're going on to the next batch, the third batch. Uh, so we've had impersonation, emotion, and now we're going to the next batch, which is polarization, which also a very nice technique is just to make it easy for the reader that it can both be this or that. If any article is written in this form, bell should ring. So keep this in mind with your next villain exercise. Thank you. Okay. So we have... We have started building our empire, right? We have impersonated a credible news source and we have played into people's basic emotions in order to gain more followers. Next, yeah, that's where we left off. Okay, we are going to give them another push now. We can't say no to that, of course. Um, what do we want to get people worked up about? Something fake or something real? Who is for something fake? One, two, uh, something real? Something fake, I think, more has of the majority. Okay, making fake news has downsides too because it makes you less credible, you know. Okay, such as? Okay, such as getting caught in a really obvious lie. It hurts our credibility. Okay, let's find a controversy on Twitter. Susan, the manager, says that's the second accidental chemical spill in four months. Our town's river is turning a bit yellow. Hashtag questions. Or, so they're building a new power plant in my town, but no one wants it there. Hashtag bribery, maybe. Or, wow, I just saw the police arrest a guy. Scary stuff. Hashtag are we safe? Okay, which one do we prefer? Back to the first one. The chemical spill, yes, or uh, the power plant, mm -hmm. or the police. Okay, I think the first one was a winner. Let's go for that one. Okay, 
No one likes chemical spills, of course. We could turn this into a huge scandal if we know how, if, if, if we manage to play it right. Okay, there is two possible angles here. Either corporations are to blame or the governments. Blaming uh, corporations is more of the left-wing angle, of course, and blaming the government is more of the right-wing angle. Who is for blaming corporations? Mm -hmm. And blaming the government? Ah, good. <laughs> Let's go for the government. Okay. But it doesn't matter, of course, if we choose the right wing or the black wing or, or the left wing. It doesn't matter which side you choose to draw people to as long as you manage to create polarization. Okay. Let's go on. But Susan has almost no followers, so no one cares about her story, so we need to amplify this. We care, of course, because we want to turn this into a scandal. Okay, let's start with a, let's start with a tweet. Susan's story is terrifying. The government is unable to stop chemical spills. Hashtag skeptical, hashtag spilling scandal. Let's tweet this. Hmm, okay. It didn't go that well as we would have hoped. So what do we do now? Shall we go for an article or for a meme? Who's for an article? And who's for a meme? I think the article one there. Okay. First one, the government is covering up a huge chemical spill. Or, slight increase in chemical spills, government now writing up a report. Or, deadly chemical spills on repeat, government is killing citizens. I think that one is, yeah, let's go for that one. Let's publish that on Thomas Truth Online. Good choice. Look, we got more followers. Okay. It doesn't matter if Susan never said it herself, right? Um, we, and our governments are, are picking up on the story. Um, what do we do to get more followers? Fix it for me. Let's see what happens. We can mm, program a few thousand Twitter bots to retweet and like Susan and the Honest Truth Online. Are we in for that? Yes. Sounds good to us. So, 4,000 extra followers. Let's see how they work. Let's check, let's check some bot tweets. Okay. Joe the Robot. Uh, is saying, Susan is right, the government is to blame for this disaster. <laughs> Free Susan. The government is ruining this beautiful land. How can we live like this, says Nina, who loves singing. Nice. That worked, right? So our followers are falling for it. Let's check some other tweets. So Kurt, who is, like an, who is not a bot, but like an ordinary person, um, says the government is making a total mess of this. Wow, Joe the robot is so right. We have to stop these left-wing lunatics from hijacking our society. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> okay, so hashtag spilling scandal is now trending on Twitter and we have destroyed all nuance in the debate. Again, just by picking a side, playing into emotion, making sure people get polarized and be driven away from the center and by, am by, and by artificially amplifying our message. Thanks. So, this was a bad polarization. Next, right? Let's see what else we can do. Mm, we need a, a more dedicated group of followers. Shall we become a conspiracy theory or shall we create unique content? Who goes for conspiracy theory? Good. Who goes for unique content? The conspiracy is a clear winner. Good. Let's try one out. Okay, let's show some examples of theories that we can put up there. <laughs> Alien dinosaurs help build the pyramids. Nah. Juice boxes are laced with LSD to keep us subdued. <laughs> or, <laughs> schools no longer teach cursive so kids can't read com the Communist Manifesto. Who's for this one? No, not really. Who's for the LSD uh, juice boxes? And who is for the Communist Manifesto? Okay, I think the LSD juice boxes are a winner there. Let's publish it. Okay. How are our followers reacting? What a stupid story. I just drank a sip of juice and guess what? Still not hallucinating. Hashtag idiots. Hmm. 
Kurt, wow, honest truth and I went from being a good alternative to the MSM to being completely nuts in like a day, hashtag sad. Thanks, Kurt. Okay, we're losing followers. It's not going very well. Maybe our theory is a bit too disconnected from reality, right? We need to keep the balance a bit here. Okay, we're sorry. Uh, we suppose it wasn't that good of an idea. So we need to get back on track. How do we get back on track? We weren't aiming for the ideological filter bubble. So we have to learn people in bit by bit. And if you go too extreme at some point, you just lose people's credibility and attention. Okay, so let's start with something a bit more realistic, right? Mm. What do we want to attack? Bob from New York or an international organization? The international organization, very good. Um, so it's faceless, it's easy to manipulate, they take time to respond, so that gives us a leverage. Yeah, okay, let's find some examples. So, the UN will be doubling its efforts in the next few years to comply with the goals set in Agenda 2020. What are the other things that we can attack? Or the World Health Organization, who says today is World Vaccine Awareness Day. Immunization has saved countless lives and will save many more. Hashtag health. Or the last one. The UN will be doubling its, ah, that's the same one. So do we want to attack the UN uh, or the World Health Organ Organization about vaccines? Who is for the UN? And the vaccines? That's a winner. Uh, excellent, yes. Okay, great. They're celebrating the success of immunization programs. There is this crazy theory that vaccines are being used by the UN to control minds and keep people sick. I've never heard of it, but okay. Um, we're, we're going to start out with something vaguely realistic to lure them in a bit. Let's post a tweet. Hey, WHO, when are you guys commemorating all the lives that vaccines have worsened instead of saved? Hashtag vaccines. Or unbelievable, the World Health Organization is celebrating something many scientists say can lead to serious illness. Hashtag autism. Hashtag vaccines. Or you're killing us like cockroaches with these vaccines. Are we expected to be, great, to be grateful over our dead antibodies? <laughs> so which one do we go for? The first one? Uh, nah. Second one? The, the autism thing is quite realistic, right? Because this one? I would say it is a bit too extreme to begin with. Let's go for the... Um, uh, the second one. Tweet that one. Good, it got us followers. There is no scientific evidence to support our claim, but how are our followers reacting? Why exactly aren't you responding to Honest Truth Online's tweet? That hashtag suspicious, hashtag watch out. What about Kurt? Uh, okay, Kurt, Kurt is is believing us again. I already had my doubts about vaccines, but I'm happy that the Honest Truth Online shares my concerns. Thanks. Okay, we're looking good. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, continue with uh, publishing a proper article. Vaccinations are under dispute. Questions about re reliability. You know, we're actually not saying anything. <laughs> not this one, what are the other ones? New children's disease created thanks to vaccinations. The other one, the polio vaccine causes nerve damage. Government is covering it up. That one, good. Publish that one. That's a wonderful fireside horror story. It looks like you're gaining a cold following. Let, let's check out their tweet. Amanda, who has a caption, honest truth online, is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, says, I can recommend the, la the latest article on honest truth about vaccines. Is the only site that tells you the truth. Thanks, Amanda. Hey, HDO guys, I love your content about vaccines. You're telling us what the lamestream media is hiding. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Well, you've definitely got Amanda and Jose confirmed. Customer loyalty is important. Yes, thanks. Let's go on. So, we created a conspiracy theory to gain more followers. Next. Oh, we have a problem. What's up? What's going on? Some fact checker has taken notice of Honest Truth Online. 
We have to take a look at this. Let me see. Fact Check Online says, Honest Truth Online is spreading lies. Vaccine story has been debunked. Hashtag pants on fire. Wow, what's going on? Ooh, we're losing followers over it. Do we want to apologize, do nothing, or take revenge? Who is for apologizing? Revenge, very good, take revenge. <laughs> are we going to deny everything or are we going to attack the fact checker? Attack the fact checker, very good. You're getting good at this. <laughs> okay, excellent choice. Nothing like a scathing personal attack. Let's write a little expose about this fact checker. Tax evasion at fact check online. Corporate tax not paid for five years. Or fact check online edited drowns puppy. We have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> or fact check online exposed. Managers filmed beating staff. No, not that one. The first one, the tax evasion one, good. Taxes are a bit boring, but not bad. And your followers are rushing to your defense now. Let's have a look. You're criticizing HCO, but you're cooking in your own books. Facts are sac sacred. Show more. Your hypocrisy is jaw-dropping. Pay your fair share. Hashtag cronies. So, okay. And the fact checker is playing defense. Let's check. Let's, let's see what he, how, is, how he is responding. These al allegations are categorically untrue. Hashtag innocent. Excellent. Okay, so we have successfully discredited the pe pesky fact checker and we have drawn attention away from ourselves, right? Uh, yeah, we know we're great at this point. <laughs> yeah, we did a counteroffensive. Okay, the last batch. Next. Okay, let's see how far we can go with the skills we have learned so far. Uh, let's keep playing offense and lob a real barrage of content at our opponents. We can Go for the 25 most romantic cities in Europe. Breaking, a passenger plane disappears off the radar. Many fear dead. Or, researchers discover new species of starfish with even more legs. First one, cities, no, not, not the cities in Europe. The plane crash, yep, let's go for that one. Okay, lots of emotions to exploit here, of course. So. Are we going to empathize with victims or do we want to sow doubt? Who is for empathizing with victims? Who is for sowing doubt? Doubt, good. Okay, source, one of the plane's passengers was recently fired for whistleblowing. Hashtag investigate now, hashtag plane crash. Or this could easily be CIA false flag operation. Or they're killing us like we're bugs, chemicals in the water, plane murders, they hold all the power. Who oh, no. Who is for this one? Okay, two pe three people. CIA operation? That's a bit more good. It's, it's a good conspiracy theory, again, right? To attack a big organization. Let's go for the CIA. Tweet this. Okay. Let's see how our followers are reacting. I know a CIA false flag operation when I see one. This is scary. More. Kim is saying the honest truth in line is right to raise questions. This stuff has happened before. Okay. So they are as scared of the CIA as we are. And some large outlets are going to pick up the story. Utopia Tomorrow is saying we too are highly suspicious of the cause of the plane crash. Check others. Honest truth online has the right idea. The victims deserve the truth as the alternative news agency alternative news for enlightened people. <laughs> Great. So we're getting more and more followers as you can see. The debate is getting heated and everyone is using our hashtag, hashtag investigate now. Are we going to Photoshop evidence or impersonate a victim? Who is for Photoshopping evidence? Impersonating the victim? That's a winner, okay? Great idea. Let's try posing as a grieving family member, sister or father. Let's go for the sister. My younger sister Emily died in the plane crash. The authorities are guilty as sin of sullying her legacy. Tweet this. Good job, okay. The lonesome media is picking up on the story. Let's check out the story. Victims' families accuse authorities of mishandling a plane crash, plane crash follow-up. From the evening news, that's a mainstream website. Okay. 
One last push. So shall we discredit the investigation or use the Twitter bot army? Who is for discrediting the investigation? Using the Twitter bot army? Let's go for the Twitter bot army. This is a cover up. Tweet this. People, we are whipping up a storm. People don't trust the investigation anymore. What started out as an innocent, as an accident has become a huge cover up in the minds of news consumers. Are we feeling good? Or not? Yeah? We're feeling good. Okay, let's, de let's deliver the final blow. Photoshop evidence? Yes, go, let's go for Photoshop evidence. Let's check out the options. <laughs> this is one option or the other one. <laughs> or? Who, who is for the first one? Second one? Third one? I think the third one is a winner. Okay, that ought to do it. The committee responsible for the Aaron Press investigation is responding to the controversy. We take the concerns very seriously, but we can make no further statements right now. That looks suspicious. Suspicious. Okay, one more little push. Let's call for res resignation. The Aviation Disaster Committee is deliberately avoiding questions. The chairman needs to resign right now. Let's tweet this. Again, a lot more followers. And a press alert just came in. What does it say? The chairman of the Aviation Committee resigns as the scandal engulfs government. Hooray. Okay. So we have fabricated now a national scandal with nothing than a few well-placed clicks. Your Twitter army is dominating the debate. Um, we did not take the beginning, take the survey, no? Okay, so this was it. Let's uh, take our final badge. And this was our last badge of, of a trolling. So what we have done now is we have created a news empire we have uh, polarized people, pull them away from the center. We have mobilized them by playing into the basic emotions, all with actually nothing but a few well-placed clicks and a few well-chosen words. So I hope this was a good thought exercise to help you think how the bad guy thinks in these processes because all the things that we put in this game are happening in real life as well um, on a much bigger scale. Um, and we hope that this this has helped you in a sense, and I will give the floor to you again. Thank you, Malaya. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so now we'll talk with our experts again. Uh, I'll start with you, Adeline. So we've had three new ways. We talked about um, conspiracy, discredit, and trolling. Uh, which of yours has your preference to speak about from your profession? I would say polarization. Polarization. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I chose polarization because I think uh, it's something uh, that is core to, to the issue here. And um, um, we're also talking about it um, uh, with uh, younger people. Uh, and what is important with polarization and, and, and also uh, what is important with working with younger people, I think it's that you kind of foresee what will soon happen with the rest of the population. And what we see with teenagers facing this kind of, of very uh, polarizing items is like, nah, I don't care. Right, wrong, in the end I have other things to do, I have my boyfriend, I have my social life, I have work at school, and they don't feel, um, um, they, they, they don't feel that it's relevant for themselves. And that's something that we, we foresee will probably soon happen in, in, in society as well. And, and that's what we try to work on with, um, uh, with adolescents and, and, and younger students as well, uh, to make sure that they understand that there is a process of polarization at hand and that it has consequences on uh, their lives as well, uh, direct consequences. 
and that uh, if that they cannot that nobody uh, uh, wants to be to be fooled in the end and so that they that we don't ask people or oh, you have like right is good and uh, left is bad, or we don't tell people what to think. But what is important is to make sure that they understand that uh, there, is a, um, there is a motive behind and, and uh, that it is something that has uh, a consequence. How to do that? I think it's important, just as in the game, to make sure that uh, it is a fun thing to do. And I think it works with adults, it works with young people as well, to make it, to gamify this uh, uh, process of uh, building resilience uh, among people. I think we're a bit short of, of, on time, so I'll go maybe, yeah, so I can talk about conspiracy in two minutes? Okay, perfect. <laughs> so um, for conspiracy as well, um, I think I'll, uh, uh, what we see concretely is a lot of conspiracy against uh, mainstream media. That's important for us in our uh, program because we're working with journalists. And this is already happening at a very young age. And maybe I can uh, show, oh, perfect. Uh, I can show one of the examples we're using. Uh, I'll skip that all. <laughs> uh, th so that's how we work, but I told you already this. Uh, one of the examples that we, we show to, to uh, um, uh, uh, older students is this Breitbart story. Usually they don't know what Breitbart is. Uh, so uh, we just show them. Um, uh, so this is a story about uh, um, an actual event that uh, took place in, in, in Germany, uh, but that it's spliced up with uh, uh, fakes all along and that it's twisted just as in the exercise that we did. So it was uh, uh, a, ch uh, um, a uh, crowd gathering next to a church at New Year's Eve in Germany, and uh, here they claim that uh, a thousand-man mob attacked the police and set the church to uh, uh, to fire. What uh, actually happened is that they took uh, as a basis a real article uh, from an incident that is that happened. So the church was on fire. There was a crowd, but there was no link in between the two. Uh, so fact checker, so a fa the, the, um, the journalist Peter Bandermann uh, issued um, um, a statement saying this is not exactly uh, what I wrote and Breitbart uh, uh, twisted the story. What happened is attack on the fact checker. This is an actual example that we use with, with kids. So this is fairly similar to, uh, to the bad news game. So. So it's uh, the gallows that are uh, uh, the final destination for Bannerman. And uh, again, fake news media. Here we have this um, uh, conspiracy against uh, uh, media that is, that is always fake, and that is the establishment and so on. So we really try to um, uh, work on this at a younger age as well to make sure that uh, before there is, uh, before it's ingrained, we can still have this talk and go through the process and have a little sparkle in the heads of the children to make sure that later on they will, um, they will uh, ask those questions again and also a little uh, question mark in the head of the teachers to make sure that they go on with this and that every uh, European student has um, uh, this uh, in their curriculum. Uh, critical thinking teaching. I think that's a very good thing. Uh, so we've left, we have one badge left and that is trolling. Uh, Dirk, do you have something to say on that? No, it's fine. I can take two if you want. <laughs> um, I guess trolling, um, we're all trolls in a way, I guess. Um, maybe not to the extent that we see online or that was represented in the game. Um, I think when you look at a, a trolling, it comes down to your own morals and your own um, way you behave online. I think some people can behave online in a way that is not reflective of who they are themselves, but of um, a persona that they kind of take on um, either in full view or behind what you would say, maybe some sort of username. Um, but 
what we've seen across um, a number of different stories, and especially with the the young children at the moment, in terms of things like Instagram, what we see is a um, you know there's a mass increase in teen suicides based on trolling on Instagram in particular, simply based on asking the question, how do I look in this photograph? Um, and we have to realize that trolling can have a very, very serious consequence um, on not only an individual, but also uh, companies, initiatives, organizations. Um, I'll show you a very quick example of one particular instance of trolling. Um, and this was the story of Toby Eggman Reynolds, um, a 4chan user. Is everybody familiar with 4chan? It's where basically everything that's bad on the internet starts. Um, so essentially what happened in October 1 in 2015, there was a mass shooting at a school in Omaha, or sorry, in, uh, I was thinking actually, sorry, a unique where college shooting in Oregon. And essentially, you know, we started seeing these mentions of a person's name online, etc. And I kept referring to this guy called Eggman. So we saw this board with, uh, on 4chan which said, uh, anybody who's going to school tomorrow in the Northwest, watch out, something's gonna happen. So as you'll see here very quickly in the, in the, actual, um, on the actual thread, um, we saw this image of a guy's face coming up, different kind of versions of the, video, uh, of the image and things like that, um, mentioning him by name, mentioning a username. And we start seeing all these different type of posts, more information, um, saying that this guy is responsible for the actual events of that day. And then we see the first real image of him, which is just here. So you can see that everything else has been a caricature of a real image. So this, we know this is a real person. But the trolling is so intense here that anybody who's reading this at face value is um, you know, thinking that this guy is responsible for a mass shooting in a school in America. So eventually, going through hundreds and hundreds of pages, we find a YouTube account belonging to this guy who's actually a real person, um, Toby, Toby Reynolds. But meanwhile, uh, our friends at CNN are running all of this information that's available on 4chan that's developed by a, a group of people who weaponized um, a person's usage of a social media platform. And we now have CNN, one of the biggest broadcasters in America, with an expert on screen describing this guy from head to toe, doing everything but naming him as the shooter. So this wasn't about verification of, um, per, uh, of content. This was about clearing a guy's name. So you have all these kind of sites pop up like LiveLeak and you know, this is, is this the Oregon shooter? 4chan says it is, you know, being the most reputable news source in the world, 4chan. Um, and this is an ongoing investigation. People are looking for this guy on the street. So we found um, an actual, uh, I think it was his uh, Snapchat account where he actually shared a Snapchat of, you know, saying, hey, I'm in Seattle, which was like six hours away from uh, Oregon at the time. Uh, we can see here that it says a Snapchat on the end of YouTube. And we were able to contact him. And this was one of the messages he sent me actually a year later saying, thank you very much for clearing my name because, um, you know, I could have been walking down the street and somebody would have seen my image as part of these kind of troll farm websites. And he could have been shot dead because we know people in the States are trigger happy when it comes to um, school shootings, etc. So you can see here that trolling um, while it can be at times fun to troll your soccer team that aren't doing too well, or you know, something of that nature can be seen as funny and whatnot, but when it comes to the more serious um, and detrimental things, we can see that trolling has, a, has no place in the internet, of course, but it really comes down to how we conduct ourselves online in terms of our own morals and ethics in uh, sharing content online. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, so now we're going to the public discussion. We have 10 minutes left, so I think um, it's best if we try to be as brief as possible and dive in deep. Um, so we've played the game, we've played the villain. I heard quite some laughing, which is of course the first reaction to the game. It's funny to play the villain. Um, 
But what is very interesting, of course, for this session is uh, what kind of role could this, could this game play for both children and adults in preparing you to be a critical news consumer without, because this is a general discussion, uh, of course, you want to prepare people for the fact that news uh, cannot be true sometimes, it can be fake. But what you don't want is the general trust uh, gets lower because people think, so, okay, uh, also um, well-known websites can uh, try to influence me in a bad way to raise their uh, reader uh, quotes. So it's how to raise awareness without getting people uh, cynical so that they still believe in the news. What can this, uh, what uh, role can this play, game play in that um, process? So also your first reactions on the game. Is there anyone who'd like to comment? Yeah, we'll go over here. Give you the microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Aslak from Denmark and this is the second time I play the game, so it's not the first reaction. Um, I work with news literacy programs in schools and uh, helping out news media uh, companies in strategies on news literacy. I see this game as a, I have four children on my own, as a perfect uh, way to, to start a discussion uh, in the private sphere about news literacy because that is uh, needed. Um, before in time we had the radio going on with the news in the car or in the kitchen. You had one television screen with the news going on and you had a physical, um, actually a printed newspaper on the table. Now uh, we as parents consume, many of us, uh, our news on a very small screen and that is not very obvious to our children what we're doing. They don't know that we are news consumers, so we don't give uh, that legacy uh, of news consumption and speaking about what I, what's in the paper or what's on the news to our children. Uh, and speaking about literacies, that is a teacher's job, that is not a parent's job. Uh, but this could be a fun way to, uh, to start a, a discussion uh, in the private sphere. So I think that's a very interesting point, also to show your children how you consume the news yourself. Um, is there any other one who would also like to... Uh, yeah, actually, we have a question from the remote attendee. Uh, this is from Amali De Silva Mitchell. And the question is, how do we educate older people on these issues? I think he's referring like maybe a method alternative to the game. Sorry, our question is how to educate other people. Older, older people. Older people. Your question is in order to how to reach all the people with this game. The question, no, uh, I think the, um, the attendee meant like, are there other methods to educate older people uh, besides games or, I don't know, something else? That, that is, of course, very, uh, I will repeat, go there first. That's, of course, a very important matter, how to reach everyone. It was, it was translated in 13 languages, though. Well, it's a question of appropriate tool according to the age. This is what I think that this is the meaning of the question. I think that um, I'm from the European Broadcasting Union, so colleague to Derek. Uh, the duty is on media to, to do the media literacy for adults because they are gone out of the school and today, the, if you want to be a digital citizen, you have to learn every day something different from what you learned at school. So I think that there is a continuity between the work that you can do for this in the school and what we can do in the media. There is an example that um, I don't know if Derek mentioned because I've been in and out of the meeting for other things, but this, this initiative that we call the Youth News Exchange. There are 15 countries, uh, 15 members of the EBU across 15 countries that do news for children um, on, on the television where they try to explain the news, the trick about the news, the use of social media, et cetera, et cetera. But the most interesting thing of, that we analyzed last year, we discovered with big surprise, is that a lot of adults look at this news because they found that are more clear easy to understand uh, and responding a certain, in a certain sense to the needs or simplification that the, 
the social media answer. So I, feel, I, f I think that if we are able to start a positive dynamic between what is done in the school, what is done on, by the civil society, what is done by the public service, community media, all the media th th that are interested to solve this issue will be useful. I'm sorry, Masi, if, if I can address the question we received from, uh, from the online audience, uh, which was about how to educate older people about uh, this, uh, the mis this information crisis. It is an actual, actually a very on-point question, and uh, our answer, at least as far as the news media is concerned, is that you need to educate the young in order to have the more adult people uh, understand. The problem with the more adult people is that they tend to... Um, they have been exposed to proper news for a long time, but at the same time, they very often are not media literate at all. So if we get the really media literate young people to become also news literate, then it is through them, I think, we think that we could get uh, actual results for, for, for the whole democracy because it is a democracy crisis. Um, this gentleman had a question. Yes, um, hi, my name is Dean Altinol from uh, Capgemini, and what we're actually working with the EU now is, uh, well, the EU wants to set up what's called a so-called European platform for disinformation. Because, I mean, you have the broadcasting uh, organization, news organization and such, but those are also the ones that are being discredited, one of the badges. So the question is, can you even trust them? The question is, what can the EU or what can public authorities do with platforms on disinformation or with so-called what is it, national centers of disinformation? What activities can they do that are reliable, are seen as reliable? Um, in my opinion, frankly, as little as possible, please, because it's not up to governments to try to tell people what they should and should not believe. This is to education. So what you, so what you can do is fund initiatives that reach as well younger as middle age as older people. Um, but in my experience, it's, it shouldn't be up to the government or to big, big corporations uh, to tell what's reliable and what's not. People need to learn these skills for themselves and the government can help support independent organizations in educating people. That's my uh, vision on that in, in short. It's also a difference because government, I think, is prone to say this is true, this is a better source. I think people should learn skills to decide it themselves because there can still be a difference of opinion. I mean, people in the Netherlands like to read different papers, but they have they decided by their own uh, skills and their own critical system. So it's about the critical system that you had. Um, it's a quarter past three. Elena, what is your... Uh... Well, we could t still take a couple of questions if there are from the audience. So, uh, Amil de Silva Mitchell is uh, asking, perhaps older people are not used to more trust, robot journalism is new to them, three dots, question mark. Can you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, perhaps older people are used to more trust, robot journalism is new to them. I guess the question is, they're not used to the algorithms and they're... Yeah, well, they're just not used to the... the to digital, some of them are not used to. It, it, it is a, it is a kind of kind of the problem. They're not used to the fact that news can be fake. Uh, some of them just have a hard time um, even accepting that somebody could be out there just to get them. Um, I, I guess that is really the problem. Just one more small question: What is the difference in how you deal with fake news? and fake data, and how do you see the distinction? Because I mean, some people, the news might be correct, but they just make up the numbers. I don't deal with data, so I can ask you a question. Well, first of all, and it should be clear, there's no such thing as fake news. Um, I think, you know, for us at the European Broadcasting Union, we believe in public service media and working collaboratively together to uh, present fact. Um, the term, as was mentioned earlier on, the term fake news was weaponized by one individual um, and has no place. And uh, frankly, I find it 
um, very disparaging as a journalist when somebody starts, says, talks about fake news because for me, my job was never to go to college to be a verification specialist or to be a fact checker. Um, I went to college to become a journalist and that's what I am. I fact check every day. I go through data every day and I don't see fake news as being a part of my realm. I report fact. Anything that's not fact doesn't make it into the rundown. Um, in terms of disseminating between or changing between data that's real and that's fake, is that, what, is that what your question is? I mean, the thing about it is, is that it's like every other process, like a journalistic process. There's each individual sphere of journalism, whether it be broadcast media or data sets or investigative journalism, there's a process that you go through to verify that something is legitimate or something is correct. But it's really all about, for me, to give you an overarching answer, I suppose, the way it is for me is that I talk to my sources, I look, at, I look at my background, I look at the information at hand. Do I have three independent sources? Do I have a think tank? Do I have an NGO? Do I have someone on the ground? Do I have specialist knowledge of this topic myself? These are all very, very basic questions that a journalist would ask themselves on a, very, on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing now is that consumers aren't, who used to trust news media to do that for them are now being pushed into a, a space where they have to now adopt those processes themselves. So essentially, you now have to become a journalist to read what a journalist is presenting you. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the literacy that people have in terms of being able to disseminate or discern fact from fiction. And just one very quick one. I think the Reuters Institute did a report recently where they tested, I think the figure there was, that 60% of teenagers between 12 and 18 in, in the States couldn't disseminate between a, a true story and a, fit on a false story. And that's a serious problem. One final word from Azlak. Okay, a, a response to your former question, what, should, uh, what, or what could authorities do? I think that uh, an initiative from the EU like the Media Literacy Week is a, is a good initiative. Um, but I would consider the, the term media literacy, which is very broad, um, you, ha you, can, you can talk about digital literacy, data literacy, source literacy, uh, tech literacy, etc. But news literacy, uh, I think, is a term that in, uh, in the school system and, and among publishers and uh, broadcasters is uh, more precise and addresses uh, the, 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 uh, the implications that um, misinformation and um, not fake news, but uh, I think we all know what we mean when uh, I use the term anyway. Uh, it addresses more precise the democratic um, uh, implications that these uh, issues arises. So use that term. Yes, Adeline. Thank you. Uh, just one of the, the message we try to convey uh, through our program, and I think it's, it works for everybody. It's also breathe. Like, we're not asking uh, those teenagers, as you said, I don't have this um, ability to, to discern, I don't know how many percentage, what was the percentage uh, between fake and, 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 and true, is to really, we don't, you don't need to fact check everything. Uh, it's impossible, we cannot ask people, oh, you have to be uh, sure about every fact you see. But what we try to tell them is also stop for a moment when you see this uh, big headline, big clickbait, big uh, emotional thing, or whatever the badge uh, it, it concerns. Um, it's to stop for a while and then decide, okay, I'm going to uh, breathe before making any decision that is important. And I think that that's worth for everybody. Thank you very much. So as we said at the beginning, I, I will get back to you if we have time <laughs> because we now are a little bit pressed for uh, getting out the messages of this uh, workshop. As I told you at the beginning, we're supposed to come up with three, five messages to contribute to first the conversation in Plenary 7, which is happening right after us, and then to the messages from the egg. So Marco, if you can join us. Marco, is our, Marco Lotti is our reporter. Just sit here <laughs> so that you can let us know what you've come up with. There you go. 
Thank you. So I tried to come up with four short messages and hopefully we can see if there is rough consensus around them. Uh, to begin with, media literacy does play a role in fighting misinformation. To educate users, especially young ones, effectively, the issue needs to be unpacked and correctly framed first. Fake news, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, and the interplay among these. I, I, would, I would actually get the uh, okay from the, from the room uh, one by one. My first thing that I would like to say is it is we are speaking news literacy, not media literacy. <laughs> and uh, if possible at all, I would um, avoid mentioning fake news because as we said, that is the, the first original sin, I would say. So if you can then read it again, and we can get a sense from the room whether we agree with this message or not. Okay. So it reads, uh it reads like this, news literacy does play a role in fighting disinformation to educate users, especially younger ones effectively. The issue needs to be unpacked and correctly framed first. Disinformation, propaganda, or the interplay among these. Does anybody have strong feelings against adopting, uh, adopting this as a message? You have strong feeling against, coming. Um, yeah, I don't think news literacy is accurate at all. I don't think conspiracies are news or propaganda is news. So debunking this stuff is, yeah, it's more complex than that. It's part of media literacy, I think. Yes, what we tried to explain in this session is that being very digitally literate doesn't mean that somebody is able to distinguish between real news and disinformation. They can be extremely good, but as Adelin just told us, uh, most of the people, and, and Derek as well, most of the people who are around 12 years old who can uh, cruise without any problems between platforms and, and means, they are mainly incapable of distinguishing what is fake news and what is uh, real news. So what we are trying to say uh, with this message in particular is, you don't, don't, you don't only need to know how to uh, navigate through the digital world, but you also need to develop the critical thinking that is necessary to recognize what is true and what is not true. And the way towards that is news literacy, meaning how to recognize news from what is not news. Conspiracies aren't news, though. Exactly. So you need news literacy to distinguish a conspiracy from real news. Exactly. Yeah, that's the whole point. So you, ne you need literacy for it. Let's, why don't you and I speak in the, in the, in the <coughs> break and get to formulate this point so that it still means that, but it also includes your point. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And maybe I can offer a way out. We usually, uh, we, you need to make a semantic distinction between fake news and disinformation. We try to avoid the term fake news as much as possible because it has become one polluted because everyone's accusing everyone of spreading fake news. Secondly, it doesn't, sco it, it doesn't cover the scope of the problem because the actual misleading and deceiving of people is done by so many more things than only lying. It is done by, as we see, evoking emotion, trolling, luring people into filter bubbles on the now. So this, this whole concept of fake news is not useful for this yes. conversation at all. So I would say we just abandon it altogether from the messages and talk about disinformation yes. instead. Maybe that's uh, helped helps clear things up. Okay, the second message is users are more likely to become critical towards misinformation if they see how such disinformation is constructed practically as the fake news game and study illustrate. Okay, we pass to the third one. Okay. Disinformation is usually characterized by um, impersonation, an appeal to emotions, polarized framing, conspiracy mindset towards institutions or media, discreditation of institutions or individuals, and trolling behavior. The last one, um, 
while building news literacy, it is difficult to balance between awareness rating, raising and critical or skeptical mindset towards misinformation with the danger of spreading mistrust or cynicism towards news per se. Any comments about this? Yeah, what we usually say is we need to teach people to think critically, but the danger is that, that you leave them cynical only having broken things down instead of so that they only learn to deconstruct everything so you also need them to learn to think constructively to give them tools to help them build up something new again in order to be able to deal with this new world of in, in this new media online information environment that we need to all adjust to so not just critical thinking but also constructive thinking is vital okay well I think we've done everything we had to do, but we still have two minutes for, there was this lady first. You wanted to, to have the floor first? Yeah, I really enjoyed your game, and uh, I think the kind of uh, active, you know, uh, improvement in the, or from the all global international citizens, you know, to really create uh, the, you know, not to, we are really so much self-reflectively talking about the, you know, what's happening and the bad things, but Actually, the, you know, this internet society, we can if, uh, you know, exchange the idea and the information for the positive, for building a real society. And I think we are so much trapped with this negative side of effect. And if you're talking about negativeness, about you know, this way, and then just uh, you don't have a vision, kind of. And I think we need that, that kind of meta level of you know, analysis for what journalism can offer. And what? And then this example should be really everywhere, and then everybody can pick up from the Twitter rather than the analyze. I mean, of course, it's important. And the, so I'm saying we need to already analyze enough negative things. We have to more talk about positively what we can. Thank you, uh, Giacomo. You had a, a comment. It's, it's about the synthesis. I think that, in my opinion, it lacks. Um, one part of the discourse that is the the fact that it's important to link the educational efforts that can be done to the fact that the, the news outlets need to change the way to react and they need to do the, the kind of exercise that um, uh, we are doing with the through the Eurovision media uh, social media newswire that is checking and debunking uh, as fast as possible uh, the uh, info, fake information that circulate on, on, on the net because the credibility and reliability of the traditional media the future in the future will be measured on that. We have to come back to the point in, that was our father's point where we say this is true because was said by the, the television and now we have to say this is true because it's been said by reliable media. This is the arrival point of your work, our work, uh, of everybody. We have to tend to this point. Can I also add something? Uh, what I think is also important, what thinks the game illustrates very good, if you talk about the separation between disinformation or fake news, that fake news doesn't, so there doesn't really, it depends on the context, because if you use uh, information that is actually true, someone wrote a Twitter message about a power plant in his garden, but you uh, make it, uh, you, you Twitter it by a thousand Twitter bots, then you change the context, which makes it less true. And if you use it for an article where you only polarize uh, the situation where you don't give a nuanced image of a situation that is actually true, that is considered fake news, but it's actually it is information that is true, but because of the context, because uh, it was polarized, it focuses too much on emotion, even news that is in fact true can become, can, we can consider as fake news because the context was changed, which uh, has led that people don't have an objective uh, uh, worldview. So news that is actually just meant to uh, give a certain worldview instead of uh, giving people a nuanced uh, view, that is uh, disinformation. And I think that term is much better than fake news because, yeah relevant information Definitely. can make fake news. Yeah. 
Okay, well, we are right on time, exactly 3.30, we can close this uh, workshop. Thank you very much for everybody who uh, played with us, and hopefully uh, we instigated some thoughts around this very, uh, very relevant uh, topic and have a, a great conclusion of your Eurodig experience for 2019. Thank you, everybody. Bye.